Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us here on this episode of Dove Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty Leadership Interview Series, where today we'll look at a specific and practical skill set that you can start using today to come up with a truly creative solution when you're faced with the toughest of problems. If you're a new listener, a new viewer, I want to thank you for stopping by. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. If you're a regular, big thank you to you for keeping us as the number one podcast for Fortune 500 and making us the top in a bunch of great categories. So thank you for sharing the show with everyone that you know. Remember, we always need your help in staying relevant. So get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip, let's strip it down and dive right in. Watching and listening to the show, you are either a high-level executive, an entrepreneur, or a leader in some capacity. And as a leader, in whatever the form, we're all faced with really tough challenges that we have to deal with. And all too often, those the deeper we look into the challenge, the more elusive the solution can seem. It can be very challenging. I don't know about you, but for me, when it comes to finding solutions that can sometimes seem impossible... I sometimes have the thought, wouldn't it be great to be like one of those guys on TV or in the movies who can take a coat hanger, a ball of string, a jar of Vaseline and a can of peas and MacGyver the way out of an impossible situation? Well, what if you could actually come up with those kinds of innovative solutions anyway? Well, if you're like me, today's show is going to be transformational for you because today my guest is Lee Zlotoff. Possibly right. <laughs> Lee Zolta. He is an award winning writer, producer, director of film, television with over a hundred primetime credits to his name. Among others, the, more, the notable creation of the iconic MacGyver TV series that has continued to run around the world for more than 30 years since it came out on TV in 1985 when some of our listeners and viewers weren't even born. And now that TV series is returning to CBS and has got an upcoming feature film done by Lionsgate Studios, who are originally from Vancouver. Also, Lee is the founder of the MacGyver Foundation, which receives a portion of the proceeds from every MacGyver project. So please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the creator of the MacGyver TV series and also the MacGyver secret, Lee Zlotoff. Woo! The crowd goes wild for me. <laughs> Welcome, man. Good to have you here. Thank you, Doug. Good to be here. It's really good to have you on. So, you created MacGyver. Well, let's start there because I, you know, let's just get this stuff out of the way because somebody's going to want to know. How did that start? How did that come about for you? I mean, because you sure. were doing tons of stuff, right? You'd been on TV and you, you'd had shows and all those kinds of things before. How did the MacGyver thing come about? Well, it actually started where I was hired to write a pilot that wasn't called MacGyver. It was called Hourglass. And they had a concept in mind that, <clears throat> unfortunately, I had to tell them wasn't really going to work. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> nobody likes to hear that their baby is ugly. But, you know, some babies are just not all that pretty. So, And, uh, and when I told them this, they, they got a little annoyed with me. But I said, look, there are reasons why your concept won't work. And they said, well, can you come up with something to fix it? And ultimately, the solution to an action-adventure hero that could do what they were looking for turned out to be the creation of MacGyver. Wow. So I think that most people in leadership roles might normally see being, see being part of Hollywood as being very different from, some, from say, being in the C-suite or, or even being a high-performing entrepreneur. Help our viewers and our listeners see how the pressures are similar in both of those worlds. Well, listen, the key elements 
of both leadership and being successful in Hollywood are having a direction or a vision and being able to make good decisions, right? right? Because if you don't have a vision, then you're wandering around and waiting for somebody else to tell you what to do. Right. And if you're a leader, then you go, no, I've got a direction and I've got a vision. And then people say, okay, so what is it you want us to do? And then you need to be decisive, mm -hmm. which is to say, we're going to do this. Now, sometimes that turns out not to be the right decision, but in Hollywood, I have learned it's always better to make a decision and start marching than to wait around and hope the decision comes to you because then you got a whole bunch of people who are going, well, we don't know what to do until we have a direction. So it's always better to choose a direction and start moving. And if you realize it's the wrong direction, then you just pivot. You know, you make a right turn, you make a left turn, you go up, you go down, but you can't get there until you basically make that decision. So one, Hollywood, like any C-suite leadership, is what's the vision, what's the direction, and what's the decisions that need to get made now so we can start moving? You know, when I think about that world, uh, the Hollywood world, and I think about entrepreneurship or leadership in general, where I see the similarities is that I think to be a great leader, and notice I, I put, I'm going to put in quotes, great leader, not just a leader, not somebody who's got a title of leader, whatever that level of title, it could be very high level. But I think what makes a great leader is the ability, not always easy, but the ability to take a punch, meaning, you know, to be rejected, to go to the next level. And over the years, uh, I've been doing what I do for more than 30 years, over the years, I've actually mentored many people from Hollywood and worked with them one-on-one -on -one who would be, you know, who have, some of them become quite famous in, in, the, in their own right, whether it's on the production side or acting or whatever it might be. And every single one of them can't count how many times they've been knocked to the canvas, can't count how many times they've gotten a no. And every leader that I've ever mentored in the corporate world or entrepreneurial world have also faced the same thing. And it's that, ad that adaptability, that ability, to, as you said, to pivot is so key. Because when we're talking about, you know, I talked about the intro, problems, I think that we tend to go at leadership and at problems with a single mindset. This is the, this is the solution, Bob. This is the solution, Sally. This is what we got to do. And then we spend a year or whatever it is and a whole lot of resources trying to fulfill that solution that's not the right solution. You've got a different goes, direction. I think it goes even a little deeper than that, Duff, though, because in Hollywood, as I'm sure it's true in business, it's very easy to equate yourself with what you do, which is if they reject my script, if they reject my film, if they reject my concept, they're rejecting me, okay? And I found that it was really helpful to create a distinction between what I do and who I am, okay? So this is what I do. If you don't like it, that's fine. That's not the sum total of who I am. I have family, I have community, you know, I have my value in other places because I'm not going to put the, my value in your hands because chances are you're an idiot. You know, just because you have a job that gets to say yes or no doesn't mean you're, you know, you're brilliant. Right. So, so I made that key distinction between this is what I do and this is who I am. And if you can make that distinction, then it's a whole lot easier to make those decisions and to take that rejection because you go, okay, they didn't like this. Let me see if I can come up with something else. But all that ego stuff doesn't get wrapped up in it. And it makes you both more resilient and ultimately more powerful. And, and a better leader. But, but you know, what you just said there is, is, is vitally important. But Sorry, but it, it is also one of those things that's thrown around. And what I mean by that is give us the practicality of that lead because you're absolutely right. Separate me from what I do. Okay, everybody goes, all right, yes, that's what it is. But how the f do I do that? That's like asking me, how do I separate myself from my flesh? For many people, it is their flesh. Their identity is in what they do. It becomes the flesh of their psychology, the flesh of their ego. How? What would you give those leaders, maybe in the next-gen leaders who are coming up, 
what would you give them as a skill or a tool for them to go, okay, that wasn't me. It wasn't about me. How, what's the practicality of that? Well, you're kind of leading right into the MacGyver's secret. Good. <laughs> you're good at this. You must have done this before, huh? A <laughs> couple of times. A couple of times. <laughs> so, without going too far in just yet, but essentially, we think there's only one part of ourselves, which is our awake, conscious mind, because that's what we spend all our time with for the most part. We wake up in the morning, it yeah. starts giving us thoughts, you know, it carries us through the day, and finally it just runs out of steam sooner or later, and we fall asleep, okay? And you think, that's me, that's who I am. But it turns out that there's another significant part of yourself which we call your inner MacGyver. Could call it your subconscious, some people call it the pre-conscious, some call it the higher self, some call it the unconscious. You know, Einstein called it the intuitive mind as opposed to the rational mind. It's got lots of names, but sure. we pretty much know what it is, okay? And if you recognize that that part of yourself is significant and important, and maybe even more significant and important than that ego hamster wheel head that drives you when you get up in the morning until you go to sleep at night, mm -hmm. then you can begin to understand that, oh, wait a minute, my value may reside with a, a deeper, stronger part of me, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is better at solving problems than the conscious ego me, right. which is so busy trying to stay on top of everything that it probably misses, mm, I would say, 98% of what's really going down. The, the understanding between the distinction between the conscious and the subconscious, you know, it obviously is an important piece. And this is, you know, vitally, I mean, I want to share this with everybody for a moment, is that you're having on average around 60,000 thoughts a day, 50% of those thoughts are repetitive, and 50% of those thoughts are negative. They're, so, you know, so understanding that this noise is always on, and the ability to turn it off is a discipline, and that's what you've first and foremost got to grasp, because I think it's going to lead us to where we need to go here in today's show. But... I think that some, I mean, I've been meditating since I was a kid, but at the same time, I know that if I, I do, every now and then I slip out of the routine for whatever the reason is, you know, get crazy busy or whatever it is, slip out of the routine, and every time I slip out of the routine, it's tough to get back in. It's tough to shut the fuck up, you know, because that noise is always on. Right. Do you, I mean, aside from the, the MacGyver method, do you have sort of a precursor, a way for people to sort of grasp how to at least turn the volume down on that racket that's going on inside most people's heads? Yeah, so, so again, this is kind of the essence of what I had to discover. So I'll just sort of give you how I came up with this. Please. And that's a, you know, so when, when I was hired to start writing episodic television, I got a staff job. This was huge. I mean, I literally went from making, you know, like a few hundred dollars a month to literally thousands and thousands of dollars a week, okay? Right. So it was like, we're talking quantum time, leap time here, okay? Except the schedules for television production are relentless. Once they turn on that machine, man, you got to feed it scripts just like you got to feed wood into a wood chipper, man. If it's, you know, it'll take your arm, it'll take your leg, because they don't ever want to turn that production machine off, because they have to pay the crew whether or not they've got something to shoot. So I was suddenly tasked with coming up with an enormous amount of creative material in unbelievably tight time schedules. And I discovered that the best stuff came to me when I was either driving or taking a shower, not when I was sitting at, this even predates computers when dinosaurs were on the earth, and I was working on a selectric typewriter, and I'd be sitting there literally racking my brain like I need an idea for a show. But it turned out that when I was either in the shower or in my car, that's where the great stuff came to me. And I went, wait a minute, this makes no sense. When I'm trying to work, I get nothing, or I get crap. And when I'm away from it, doing something entirely different, is when the great stuff comes. So I said, why is that? 
And I realized that when you're driving or showering, even though those are both sort of routine activities, they're both second nature. I mean, you don't get creative when you drive. You don't get creative in the shower. You know, you just and if do you do, routine. it's not part of this show. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that that conscious mind, that ego, that hamster wheel of thoughts has to pay attention when you're doing those two things. Mm -hmm. When you're driving, even though it's second nature to drive, you got to pay attention to where you're going, who's in front of you, who's behind you, on the left, on the right, how fast, so forth and so on. Same thing in the shower. You don't want to get soap in your eyes or water up your nose. You don't want to slip and fall. You've got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And because that conscious mind had to pay attention, it allowed my subconscious, or what I call your inner MacGyver, to come up with the solutions I was looking for. And I went, damn, this is amazing. Now, of course, it wasn't particularly efficient because when I would get jammed up in the office, I'd go running out of my car, drive around Hollywood looking for a shower. <laughs> and this, you know, this had a certain amount of inconvenience because at a certain point, people in the office went, okay, this guy's either a drug dealer or he's sleeping with everybody in town because he disappears for no apparent reason and comes back freshly showered. Or he's a germaphobe. He's a germaphobe because he goes out four times a day for a shower. <laughs> so I realized, okay, i got to find a better way to do this. Right. And, and what I discovered was I put a whiteboard and a workbench in my office. And the whiteboard was to write down the questions or the problems I had and the answers. And the workbench, I built models. You ever hear of like building Empire State building out of paper? Yep. Man, I built every every model kit they had. I built the Empire State building. I built the Taj Mahal. I built the Vatican. I built a, a paper model of the Brooklyn Bridge. Trust me, Doug, no one needs a paper model of the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay? I mean, really, but But all of that would model. all of that would focus your conscious mind. It kept that conscious mind off the problem. Right. So I would go to the whiteboard, and this is now we're getting into the really the nuts and bolts of the MacGyver secret, but I would go to the whiteboard and I'd say, man, they're standing out there screaming at me, we need a new episode. What's a new episode? And then mm -hmm. rather than stand at the whiteboard and rack my brain, I'd simply say to that inner MacGyver or subconscious, hey, you're the one with all the great ideas, you work on this, I'm going to go work on that model and not think about the problem. And when I come back, you're going to have a kick-ass answer for me. And so I would sit there and I would cut and I would glue and I would fold and I would paste. And it was, you know, it was almost kind of idiot work. But it kept my conscious mind occupied so it couldn't get in the way. And then after half hour, 45 minutes, an hour, I'd go back to the whiteboard and I'd say, okay, what do you got for me? And then I would simply start writing anything at all. I would write the Spar Spangled Banner. I'd write what I wanted for lunch. And within 30 seconds of those answers would just flow out of me right onto that whiteboard. And I would have three or four great ideas for an episode right. without thinking about it. Right. Because that deeper part of myself was working on the problem. And I was making sure that the hamster wheel ego that's afraid of everything was out of the damn way. Right. And in a nutshell, those are the three basic steps of the MacGyver secret. And all you need, you don't need a whiteboard, you don't need a workbench. All you need is a pen and a piece of paper. And there are no shortage of what we now call incubation activities. You don't have to build models of the Brooklyn Bridge. Right. Okay? You know, there's no shortage of other things you can do. There's exercise, there's puzzles, there's I mean, there's literally any form of exercise will work great. Mm -hmm. uh, any form of, of uh, concentration, jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles, Sudoku's, you want to practice a musical instrument. If you got to do something like clean the house, cleaning the house is great. Washing the car is great. Walking the dog is great. All those things will work fine as incubation activities. There's really only a few that don't work. So, but, so coming coming to this for a minute because I think um, I want to have people grasp this. This is, you know, I think where people get stuck is the I've got a problem. I got to focus in on the problem. Got to focus in on the problem. Got to focus in on the problem. The problem doesn't go away. It actually gets bigger or seems bigger or seems more overwhelming. Versus what I would 
suggest, my words, not yours, um, is a mindful meditation, active meditation of being fully present with doing something that, so the conscious mind is fully present. Now, one of the exercises we used to do in one of our trainings was, um, and we still do it sometimes with our corporate clients, is that, you know, we're doing a multi-day training, and one of the things I say is, okay, you know, we're about to do this brainstorming, or we're about to do this activity, or whatever it is, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have lunch, but you, know, but you can't speak. You know, what do you mean? You can't speak, there's no music, there's nothing. You can't even speak to the people serving you. Cannot speak. You're not allowed to speak. And they go, okay. So, you know, it's all set up. The food is there. They go pick it up, whatever. They're not allowed to speak. and But they're instructed that they must taste every bite. That they must chew every bite. That they must smell it all. They must notice the way it lands on the plate. It's total mindful focus on that meal. And when we come back, we ask, well, what was that like? And it's fascinating for me. Because there's, there's two generalized answers. One is that it was really uncomfortable. And they felt like, you know, they were having an anxiety attack. Oh, my God. Like, ah, you know, I don't know what to do, right? Because now the hamster didn't run. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's Usain bolting around that thing, bouncing off the walls, trying to, trying to come up with something to do. Or they went, wow, it was really peaceful. And the people who went, it was really peaceful, always came up with better ideas. So my answer um, uh, to them was, here's the demonstration of what can happen, as you just said. You got great ideas. Now, for the other two of you who it was painful, all that is is a clue that you need to do it more. Not that you need to do it less, but you need to do it more. But that I think that the, the important piece of what you were saying here that I want everybody to grasp is you have to create an activity that will engage the conscious mind because the conscious mind, just so everybody understands, is a deletion machine. It's constantly deleting stuff. That's not important. That's not important. That's not important. That's not important. And, and as I like to say, if you find something important, maybe you're watching this right now and you go, oh, that's really good. Lee just said that. Yeah, that's really good. I'm going to do it. Yes, I'm going to do that. Here's what's going to happen. Your ego mind is going to go, that's a great idea. What? What? Because <laughs> like that is going to intrude on what we're doing now, and and you know it might get in the way of us worrying and freaking out. So let's throw that away, and keeping that mind focused, which is what I really hear you saying, is you've got to give it something to focus on that doesn't take thinking but takes focus, and that's the distinction, right? Right, because the first step of this process is to. Write the problem down. Actually, better to do it in longhand than to type. There's scientific research that, that demonstrates, which is in the book if you care to read it, because I have a co-author who's a PhD in psychology and cognitive science. Um, there are certain parts down, of the brain that work when you write by hand that do not work if you type. And we live in a digital age where we're always constantly typing and it doesn't work the same. Listen to what Lee's telling you. Get out a piece of paper, get a whiteboard, get a marker, write it down. And by the way, if you don't have one right now as you're listening to this, let me give you a, a tip that I teach people. If you're watching this right now and you want to remember something but you don't have a pen, you don't have a paper and you can't write because you're listening or you're viewing, here's what I want you to do. Write the note in the air. Use an imaginary pen. This is a, a really powerful trick. Use an imaginary pen and write whatever it is by hand in the air. And if you write it, once you've done that and you're going, what was that tip now? And you look up to where you wrote it in the air, you get it. It's amazing what, it, what the brain can process if you give the right strategies. So Lee, is what it's telling you is vitally important. You must Right by hand. I know we live in the digital age. I know it seems like something that was only as old farts do, but really, I guarantee you, there's a great deal of benefit. So listen to what Lee's saying. Long hand. So you write that question or problem down. That can be one sentence. That can be a paragraph. That can be a whole page. And once it's written down, then you say to that inner self, inner MacGyver, subconscious, okay. Here's the problem. I've written it down. You work on it. Turn it over to that amazingly deeper, smarter, faster processor inside of you and say, you work on the problem. And then you go do something else and you don't 
think about it. You let it go because you will discover that that other part of you is busy working on the problem, even if you're going for a jog or a swim or shooting baskets or whatever it is. But that part of you has been tasked by you now to work on the problem. And everybody's got an inner MacGyver or a subconscious. Everybody's got this capability. The trick is learning to adapt it to the way you live and you work. But it works for everybody. I've done literally dozens and dozens of workshops with hundreds of people from all walks of life, CEOs to students, doesn't matter. Works the same for everybody except the specifics of how you adapt it. What activity works best for you? Is it better for me to do a jigsaw puzzle or build a Lego or go for a run? That you discover by trying, okay? But once you write that down, you tell your inner self, inner MacGyver, you're gonna solve this problem and then you just let it go and you go do something else and you say to yourself, I'm gonna come back in a certain amount of time. I usually encourage people to start with a minimum one to four hours. Mm -hmm. And then you come back and then you say, okay, I wrote it down. I gave it to you to work on. I did something else. I'm back now. I'm ready for the answer. And you ask that inner MacGyver, what do you got for me? And then you simply physically start writing. It really doesn't matter what you write. You can write a recipe. You're going to write a pornography novel. It doesn't really matter. You just start writing, and within 30 to 60 seconds at the most, the answers will actually start flowing out of you. And you can do this, like, look, I've been doing this for the better part of four decades now. And so when I write down a question, I usually get back an answer within 10 or 15 minutes. Right. You know, it's like any other muscle. The more you exercise it, the better it works. And is it a kind of meditation that you're doing? Yes, it is a kind of meditation because you are getting that conscious mind out of the process of solving the problem. Because it turns out it's not really good at solving problems. We're taught in our schools that that's how you solve problems. We give you information, then we challenge you, and then your job is to pull up that information as quickly as possible. That's not really problem solving. That's just regurgitation information. <laughs> Parroting. And when you get to the real world and you really have to solve problems, we are unfortunately ill-equipped to do it because we've never been taught that there's a better way to solve problems. I and that, that this that. simple three-step process is really all you need. It's incredibly simple. It's incredibly easy. You don't need any mumbo-jumbo. You don't need any drugs. You know, you Man. can just do it. With, with a pen and a piece of paper. Well, if you want drugs, that's another story, but, you know. <laughs> anyway, so that's the essence of it. The essence of it is that everybody's got this problem-solving capability inside of them. And what the MacGyver Secret teaches you to do is basically tap directly into that problem-solver. So I want to I I present, if I may, because I want to be the voice of our viewers and our listeners, two challenges. First one is... When I speak to people, generally speaking, it's very evident to me that most people don't know what they want. It's, it, it blows my mind that most people don't actually know what they want. Therefore, it's very difficult for people to identify the problem. So when you say write down the problem, I find that many people write down what they think is the problem, but, you know, in the work that we do one-on-one -on -one with, when I mentor clients, I, I say, what is the problem under the problem? What, you know, so you're looking for a solution. So, you know, the old analogy, you're hungry. The, okay, the, the problem is I'm hungry. The solution is for me to eat something. Uh, no, the, the solution is for you to learn how to, how to get the food on a regular basis. Uh, you know, the fishermen and fishing, etc. So this part of the challenge is that I think that people don't identify the problem. If they don't clearly identify the problem, they may get a solution, but it will be at best a semi-permanent solution. So let's start there. How do we help them to identify the real problem as opposed to the cognitive problem, the, the one that's on the surface? The problem on the surface is how do I get back my, my, my partner who's left me for somebody else? That ain't the problem, buddy. But if you think that's the problem, you, you may get solutions like, you know, go and stand outside with a beatbox 
uh, like John, like John Cusack and, and you know hope for some, but that's not really going to give you the, the solution. How do you help them to get to the real solution, Lee? So there, there are two answers to that question. Um, the first one is, is in the Quick Start Guide, which you can get for free, and the mini video course, which you can get for free, but certainly in the book, we give you sample questions. We give you practice questions that say, that allow you to look at the same thing from lots of different, you know, perspectives. Right. What have I been thinking about blank? Why am I having trouble with blank? What is the real issue about blank? You know, and then you can just plug in the blanks there, okay? So, so because you're right, learning to ask questions is an art that most of us have never been taught. It's like questions like, how much is that? Or do I want a large coffee or a small coffee? Those questions we know how to ask, but like, what is it I'm really looking for? What is it I really want? These are questions we're not really taught how to ask. Yeah. So, step one, there's things you can do to practice that, okay? Step two is, whatever form you write the problem down in, and challenge or task that inner MacGyver or subconscious to work on, it will come back to you, and more often than not, it'll come back to you with more questions. Yes. So, instead of just, boom, here's the answer, it goes, wait, are you asking this or are you asking that? Okay, because you haven't defined the problem for me, and I'm trying to help you solve this problem, but I got to really understand what is it you really want here. And so, all you do then is you look at the questions you got back, and you simply turn right around and hand them back to your subconscious or your inner MacGyver and keep that dialogue going. And eventually, usually in a relatively short period of time, I mean, literally in the course of a day when we do this in a workshop, by the end of the day, People are super clear now about what the issue really is and where to start looking for the answer. Right. Because that part of you, that inner MacGyver, it's trying to help you. It yes. wants to work with you. It's yours. Doesn't belong to me. Doesn't belong to somebody else. It's yours. It wants to communicate with you. It wants to help you. You just have to give it the opportunity to do that, and you have to give it the opportunity such that you can hear what it's saying to you. And by writing down the questions and the answers, you begin to have this dialogue with that deeper part of yourself. And so it will help you reveal what is it you're really trying to ask here? What's the problem you're really looking at? And now I can help you try and find out the right answer, whether that's a technical problem, a creative problem, a business problem, or a personal problem. It doesn't care. It can yeah. turn its juice on to anything you want to deal with. You just have to learn how to communicate with it. Okay, so let's say, on to the second player. So let's say that they've gotten clear, they've gone through all the examples, and you know, they're all there in the book for anybody who wants to know. You're actually there, all the sample questions and ways for you to attack the problem from different angles so that you're actually getting to the source of it. Um, now let's go to the second challenge, which is that when a problem is big, you know, meaning it feels big to that person, even when they're in the shower, or, or as I like to say, uh, the three S genius. This is one of the things we talk about in one of my programs called the three S genius, which is shit, shave, and shower. If you're doing any of those, there's a good chance for the genius to bubble to the surface. But even when a problem is oppressive, and it can feel that way, when it feels massive, it can be hard to shut that up, you know, enough to, you know, even while uh, trying to make a model or do a jigsaw puzzle or doing those things. And, and it seems to, that conscious mind seems to come up with these snipey answers um, or blame. You know, the reason the problem is because of, Fred or her or him or whatever it is. So it's coming up with snipey blames or it's coming up with solutions. Because one of the things you and I, I'm sure, have heard all the time is, I've tried everything. Well, clearly you've not tried everything because you haven't got a solution yet. There must be someone else. But it, that's that conscious mind piece. Help them to, to get a strategy around shutting that up even when they're doing this mindful, 
focused showering or jigsaw puzzle or whatever it might be. How, you know, when it, I'm sure you've had this, Lee, for yourself, especially in the pressure of Hollywood, where you've got to come up with it now and it won't shut up. How do you get it to quieten? Well, then the trick is to find that activity where it's absorbing enough that you can't do both. Mm. Like, you you know, it's it's like if you're standing in front of a batting machine, okay, and you're trying to hit that ball, it's like you can't worry about the problem and focus on hitting the ball at the same time. So if it's like, okay, this machine is going to be throwing something at me at like 40 to 80 miles an hour, I like I can't focus on the problem because I got to hit that ball or it's going to hit me. Right. So, you know, you got to find the activity, whatever that happens to be now. It turns out, you know, in our in our workshops, we give Legos because, you know, the guys love Legos. And yeah. you think, well, this is just ridiculous. Well, but you got to really focus on that diagram because they don't give you any instructions. They just show you. Now you got to put these blocks here. Now you got to put those blocks there. Now you got to really kind of look at it, yeah. you know, in order to, it's like, it's very hard to actually do that. And have that hamster wheel still going. Right. Okay. So the trick is, if you are someone who has trouble sort of shutting off that noise in your head, then find an activity that you know will keep that noise from getting in there because it's, you, you just can't do both. Okay. So that's how I would generally encourage people to go in that direction. More often than not, even if it's something as simple as a, you know, an adult coloring book, which are all the rage now, right? You sit there and you color for a while and you really concentrate on, oh, I want this color here. and I, I'm going to go in the lines. I'm going to go outside the lines, whatever it is. But even that amount of focus is usually enough to turn off right. that anxiety, which, as you say, more often than not gets in the way of solving the problem. Sure. Your deeper self is working on the problem. And after you do this a couple of times, you begin to trust that, you know what, there's a great answer waiting for me. I mean, once I knew that I could get a great answer whenever I needed, the stress went away, duh. You know, that bubble of anxiety with, that we tend to all walk around and it just literally evaporated because they went, hey, Lee, we got to have a script from you in a week. I go, okay. Why? Because it wasn't on me. I knew that I could get those answers from deeper inside of me. And so the stress just went away because I went... I'll just ask my inner MacGyver, and the answers will show up. And by God, they always did. So the more you do it, the more you realize, okay, it helps me to let go of that noise because the noise isn't solving the problem. My deeper self, that inner MacGyver, that subconscious, is ready to solve the problem. All I have to do is get the hell out of the way. Tell it what I want. Tell it to do it. Go do something else, and then come back and say, what do you got? And they'll always have an answer in all of the workshops we've done, Doug. Nobody has ever drawn a blank. Right. Nobody has ever asked a question and gotten back nothing. It never happens. Right. Because that part of you is trying to talk to you all day long anyway. You just don't know how to listen to it. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, I was having a conversation with uh, Stephen Cutler, who you may know uh, from Flow Project. And Stephen was, was actually highly recommending the MacGyver uh, strategy, your strategy, um, and we're saying to people about that. And we actually had a conversation around a piece um, that's in your book because one of the things you, you, you say is that to not do conversation. And, and Steve and I were having this conversation about that works perfectly for me. Conversation works great for me. It's a strategy because I play a lot in that unconscious mind. I like that. Um, and simply by the external processing of, of talking through a problem, I can get to a solution really quickly. Um, but generally, based on what you were saying in the book, that's not a good idea, the conversational piece. Is that right? Yeah. So, so there are kind of four activities that I suggest people avoid when they're trying to basically let their inner MacGyver solve a problem. So conversation is one of them. Yes, if you're talking to the right person and you're quote unquote brainstorming, you know, sometimes that can be effective. But generally, if you're trying to really search for an answer from your deeper self, 
conversation is not going to help um, because it uses up too much of that subconscious processing. The same is true of watching television or videos, mm -hmm. reading not a good activity, or playing super intense interactive video games. So you want to play Candy Crush or Pokemon Go or Angry Birds or Tetris, that's fine. But if you want to play World of Warcraft or, you know... The dem anything that demands duty, a lot of thinking. The problem is... With any of those activities, television, reading, conversation, or super interactive video games, your subconscious is actually creating the universe for you. You think the show and the story is on the television screen. There's nothing on the television screen but a series of disconnected images that are going by at a 30th of a second, okay, and a bunch of sounds all of which your subconscious or inner MacGyver is processing at a phenomenal rate to weave together so that you think it's a moving picture, even though it's not, and you are putting all together those bits of sounds so that they have meaning and cohesiveness. So you think the show is on the TV screen. There is no show on a TV screen. The story is in your head, man. Yes. The story is being created by your inner MacGyver at, you know, literally hundreds of nanoseconds a moment, yep. okay? So those, when you're using all that processing power to create a world for yourself, either from a book or a TV show or a video or a highly interactive game or even in a conversation, because you and I both know, even while I'm talking and you're listening to me and registering what I'm saying and my intonation and my body language, you're also formulating an answer to start talking as soon as I stop. So you're using a lot of that processing power to maintain this conversation. Consequently, it can't be working on the problem you handed to it because it's it's using all that, you know, all those server boards <laughs> to, to deal with the immediacy of the situation. So all those other activities, driving, showering, exercise, you know, origami, knitting, practicing a musical instrument, any of those things, working in the workshop, you know, any of those things is fine because they don't involve conversation. You're not watching or reading or playing a heavy duty video game. And you are keeping that conscious mind focused on something that that will allow it to be preoccupied so that your inner MacGyver or subconscious can really be solving the problem you put to it. Now, you've created a, a, an online video course to go along with this. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So there's a mini video course which you can download for free. The, uh, the large 12-week online course will be coming out within the next few weeks. Um, and, um, and that, again, the purpose of that is to really teach you how to adapt this to the way you live and work. Because it works a little differently for everybody. Of course. When you ask the questions, what you do between when you ask for the questions and ask for the answers, you know, the kinds of things, activities you might want to do, the way it works into your office life if you have that. There's a, you know, chapter on doing this with the team because a lot of people work in teams these days. Like, how would this work with the team? So we've yeah. looked at all that stuff, and we've got all that information. And what the online course really allows you to do, even more so than the book, is week to week, how do I start weaving this, integrating this into my life in such a way that it's there whenever I need it and whenever I want it? Because those answers are available to you whenever you want. And anecdotally, I would say 65 to 75% of the time you ask a question, you're going to get back an answer that surprises you. Hmm. You're going to go, where did that come from? Sure. Well, it came from you, but what you're really saying is my conscious mind would have never come up with that idea. That's exactly right. There are two-thirds of the time, if not three-quarters of the time, there's a better idea inside of you if you just knew how to get to it. Very cool. Tell us, what's, what's one thing that... Um, I mean, you, as I said, you probably, I can't even imagine how many interviews you've done over the years, not just for the MacGyver, uh, your own book, but like, you know, before for the TV show and for other things you've done. What is the one 
question that you wish people would ask you. They don't generally ask you. This is full Monty, so we like to strip it all off. Sure. <clears throat> the question they almost never ask is, why are you doing this? You know, like, why are you doing this as opposed to doing something else? Why did you write this thing? Right. Or why did you choose to go in this direction? It's always presumed somehow that, you know, there's a reason there, but they rarely ever ask the reason. It's like, you know, I talk to obviously aspiring writers and filmmakers all the time, <clears throat> and they always want to tell me, you know, well, I'm working on a movie or I'm working on this. And I always say to them, well, what's it about? And then they start telling me, well, there's this guy and he does this. And I said, no, no, I didn't ask you what happened. I asked you what it was about. Yeah. And they go, what? And you go, okay, there's a difference between what happens and what something really about. Is it's this, about what kind of, it's about What kind of a story are you trying to tell? Right. Okay. So the one question most people don't ask is, why are you doing this? <laughs> so why are you doing this? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm doing this because... MacGyver turned out to be literally a global phenomenon. Listen, I don't really take credit for that. I mean, I wrote the pilot, I created the blueprint, but, you know, it's like having a kid. You have a kid, the kid grows up, does something amazing. You go, well, I'm proud of the kid, but the kid did it. I didn't sure. do it, you know? Yeah. MacGyver is a kid. It went out there and it turned into this global phenomenon. I mean, it's now a verb in the Oxford English Dictionary, yeah. you know? So <clears throat> you don't sit down and say, hey, I think I'll create a verb. You know, it doesn't work that way. And when I looked at it, I said, well, why did it become such a global phenomenon? And the answer I realized in looking at it was, one, he doesn't use a gun. So most action-adventure heroes start with a gun, yeah. okay? And because MacGyver didn't use a gun, he had to come up with a more innovative, creative solution, right? How do I take nothing and turn it into something? And finally, he always had a sense of humor and humility. Now, most action adventure heroes are cocky sons of bitches, you know? James Bond, very smug, shaken, not stirred. You know, Rambo is like, I'm going to tear their heads off and shut down the hole, you know? I mean, even Indiana Jones, you know, there's that, there's that bravado, okay? MacGyver, he was this low-key guy, always had a sense of humor, no matter how frightening or intractable the problem seemed. You know, he was the smartest guy in the room. He never acted like the smartest guy in the room, okay? And I went, you know what? These are great management tools for this century. I got four grown children. I'm lucky enough to have four grandchildren. Not hard for me to now imagine them having children. And I thought, you know... This, this is a critical century. We get this century right, this civilization has a future. We don't get this century right, maybe not. There have been lots of civilizations on this planet. Every one of them thought they were the bomb sure. until they weren't anymore, right? The Romans, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Aztecs, the Mayans, you just go down the list, man. There's literally dozens, if not more, that we don't even know about, Right. okay? So, I thought, you know what, here's this character that people literally around the world for 30 years love, okay? I mean, we're talking billions of people now, if it's been on for 30 years in 75 countries, more or less nonstop, okay? And I thought, you know what, these are great management tools for this century. One, don't pick up a gun, avoid conflict, because conflict usually just leads to more conflict. And guess what? Even if you win, the house is still on fire. You haven't solved the problem. Two, ingenuity, creativity, resourcefulness. How do you turn what you have into what you need? Because that's something we're all going to have to do now as individuals, as communities, as countries, as a civilization. There is no country in the world anymore, Doug, that can say, you know, we have all the resources we will ever need. We can roll up our borders. The rest of you can go to hell. We're going to be just fine. It doesn't exist anymore. Like it or not, we are a global civilization. We've been a global economy for the better part of 75 years. We're now truly a global civilization, interconnected the way we are with digital stuff, all right? So, guys, we're all in this together, all right? So, 
How do we turn what we have into what we need? We're seven and a half billion people now. We're going to be nine billion people before we know it. Food questions, water questions, waste management questions, energy questions. We have the capacity to solve all this. Right. Okay. Provided we can get that ego out of the way and go, what's really the solution? Okay. And when you're trying to solve a problem, never helps to have a sense of humor and humility. Because a laughing, open, relaxed mind is a lot more likely to come up with a good solution than a frightened, resentful, or angry mind. So I went, you know what? If I do nothing else with the rest of my life, oh, and by the way, another astronomical unlikelihood, I ended up owning all the rights to MacGyver. I mean, the studio just dropped the ball at some point and fell in my lap. I take no credit for being brilliant at anything. My lawyers weren't especially great. It just happened, okay? And I went, okay, how often does this happen? So I'm going to bring MacGyver back in as many entertainment platforms as I can, what you would call a transmedia play, right? And just remind people that, A, you can solve problems, try and avoid conflict, you can figure out how to turn what you have into what you need. Try and do it with a sense of humor and humility. And to kind of put the icing on the cake, I went, you know what? I have this technique that I developed for creating writer, creative writing purposes, but has now been used by inter internet entrepreneurs, CEOs, scientists, doctors, lawyers, you know, to pr solve problems. And I thought, okay, this is the Swiss Army knife of the mind. So I'm going to put that one out there, too, and say, so if you say, okay, Lee, you say we should try and figure out how to turn what we have into what we need, exactly how do we do that? I go, here's the MacGyver secret. Now you have a way to do that. Simple, practical, no nonsense, no mumbo jumbo, no spirituality, just do the damn job, okay? And, it's, it's, and we can do it. We have the resources. If we have the resources to build the civilization, we have the resources to save the civilization and protect the civilization. So I thought, okay, people like MacGyver, people get MacGyver, people know what that's all about. Here's the MacGyver secret to tell you exactly how you can use this for yourself or your company or your business or your relationship. Go for it. That's why I'm doing it. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Lee, tell our viewers and our listeners where they can find out more about you, about uh, your book, about the courses, about whatever it is that you would like them to know, because I'm sure we've got a lot of people intrigued here, and I'd love for them to be able to find out a lot more about you and what are you doing. Sure. Well, the first place to start is simply MacGyverSecret.com. The website has, you know, as I said, the quick start uh guide that you can download for free, the mini video course that you can download for free. The book is available there. The book will, is also available on Amazon, both in Kindle form and paperback form. So you can find it. But, you know, if you want to just try it out, just go download the free stuff and try that. And if you like it and you want more, then you can buy the book. And if you still want more, then you consider buying, you know, the online training course. But, but really, you know, just try it. It's free, you know, Fabulous. and and it's available. For me, this is much more about doing something for my children and my grandchildren than how quickly can I make a buck? Because I don't need to make a buck. They're making a new MacGyver TV series. They're making a new MacGyver feature film. It's like, guys, this isn't about making a buck. This is about changing the world. And that's something I think we all have a responsibility to do. So get yourselves over to MacGyverSecret.com, and I'll just spell it for you, but we will put it on the website there so you can find it and it'll be in the, in the, in the information. But MacGyver is spelled M-A-C-G-Y-V-E-R, and then the word secret, all is one word, dot com. MacGyverSecret.com, you find out there. Hey, Lee, I wanted you to know, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being on the show. It's been great having you here. But I also want you to know that the MacGyver building, as you probably well know, is is about mm, it's about four minutes walk from where I live. It's just up there, that building with the, with the, the concrete goes in the bottom. Uh, I don't know what the actual building is, but I know it used to used to be used in the show as if it, that was the entrance to his building. So there's you know there's a little bit of uh, I never actually was a big I didn't follow the show. I when I first came to Canada, it was pretty new in 1988. It was a pretty new show, but people it was really popular, and I remember seeing that building and go, 
Oh, and that's just up the street from me. So that's really cool. And, and, I, and I love what, you're, what you've had to say here, you know, as we've summed it up here, that we need solutions. We need ways to think about the problems that we face today in order to keep this civilization alive. And that, that is truly what leadership is. That's what you need to know. That's what leadership is. It's, it's, it's sustainability. It, it is about the legacy. It's about all those things. And what Lee has offered you here is a strategy for being able to do that. So I really want you to grasp how important that is for you as a viewer, as a listener, as a leader. Again, MacGyverSecret.com. I want to thank Lee for joining us here today. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure having you with us. I hope you'll stay with us till the very end. And I'm just going to sign off and I want to thank you, dear listener, dear viewer, for tuning in. And remember that the companies that get to the top and stay at the top are the ones that are purpose-driven. If you're truly serious about having the kind of laser beam clarity about your company's purpose and building a culture of high-performing, highly engaged leaders that are fiercely loyal, then reach out to me. My name is Dov Barron. You can find me through FullMontyLeadership.com, where we provide the essential leadership skills for today's good leaders who are committed to becoming great leaders of tomorrow while growing their people and the bottom line. Why? Because hard skills will get you there, but it's the soft skills that will keep you at the top and make sure when you get to the top, you're not there alone. Remember to stop by The Matrix too, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com and you can get your free assessment, absolute gift to you, value at $197, absolutely free, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank again our guest. It's been awesome having you here. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, share the show with everybody you know. Until next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about how you can push that conscious hamster wheel to the side and let your inner MacGyver flow. Till next time, this is Dove Baron, and I am out.